Samuel Cook, known professionally as Sam Cook, was an American singer, songwriter, and entrepreneur. Considered to be a pioneer and one of the most influential soul artists of all time, Cook is commonly referred to as the King of Soul, for his distinctive vocals, notable contributions to the genre and high significance in popular music. Cook was born in Mississippi and later relocated to Chicago with his family at a young age, where he began singing as a child and joined the Soul Stirrers as lead singer in the 1950s. Going solo in 1957, Cook released a string of hit songs, including, You Send Me, A Change Is Gonna Come, Cupid, Wonderful World, Chain Gang, Twistin' the Night Away, Bring It On Home To Me, and Good Times. During his eight-year career, Cook released 29 singles that charted in the top 40 of the Billboard Pop Singles Chart, as well as 20 singles in the top 10 of Billboard's Black Singles Chart. In 1964, Cook was shot and killed by the manager of a motel in Los Angeles. After an inquest and investigation, the courts ruled Cook's death to be a justifiable homicide. His family has since questioned the circumstances of his death. Cook's pioneering contributions to soul music contributed to the rise of Aretha Franklin, Bobby Womack, Al Green, Curtis Mayfield, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, and Billy Preston, and popularized the work of Otis Redding and James Brown. All music biographer Bruce Ader wrote that Cook was the inventor of soul music, and possessed an incredible natural singing voice and a smooth, effortless delivery that has never been surpassed. Cook was also a central part of the civil rights movement, using his influence and popularity with the white and black population to fight for the cause. He was good friends with boxer Muhammad Ali, activist Malcolm X and football player Jim Brown, who together campaigned for racial equality. Early life Cook was born Samuel Cook in Clarksdale, Mississippi, in 1931. He was the fifth of eight children of the Reverend Charles Cook, a minister in the Church of Christ, and his wife, Annie May. One of his younger brothers, L.C., later became a member of the doo-wop band Johnny Keys and the Magnificents. The family moved to Chicago in 1933. Cook attended Doolittle Elementary and Wendell Phillips Academy High School in Chicago, the same school that Nat, King, Cole had attended a few years earlier. Cook began his career with his siblings in a group called the Singing Children when he was six years old. He first became known as lead singer with the Highway QCs when he was a teenager, having joined the group at the age of 14. During this time, Cook befriended fellow gospel singer and neighbor Lou Rawls, who sang in a rival gospel group. Career The Soul Stirrers In 1950, Cook replaced gospel tenor R. H. Harris as lead singer of the gospel group The Soul Stirrers, founded by Harris, who had signed with Specialty Records on behalf of the group. Their first recording under Cook's leadership was the song, Jesus Gave Me Water, in 1951. They also recorded the gospel songs, Peace in the Valley, How Far Am I From Canaan, Jesus Paid the Debt, and One More River, among many others, some of which he wrote. Cook was often credited for bringing gospel music to the attention of a younger crowd of listeners, mainly girls who would rush to the stage when the soul stirrers hit the stage just to get a glimpse of Cook. Billboard's 2015 list of the 35 greatest R&B artists of all time includes Cook, who broke ground in 1957 with the R&B, pop crossover hit, You Send Me. And his activism on the civil rights front resulted in the quiet protest song, A Change Is Gonna Come. Crossover pop success Cook had 30 U.S. top 40 hits between 1957 and 1964, plus three more posthumously. Major hits like, You Send Me, A Change Is Gonna Come, Cupid, Chain Gang, Wonderful World, Another Saturday Night, and, Twistin' the Night Away, are some of his most popular songs. Twistin' the Night Away was one of his biggest selling albums. Cook was also among the first modern black performers and composers to attend to the business side of his musical career. He founded both a record label and a publishing company as an extension of his careers as a singer and composer. He also took an active part in the civil rights movement. His first pop, soul single was, Lovable, a remake of the gospel song, Wonderful. It was released under the alias, Dale Cook, in order not to alienate his gospel fanbase. There was a considerable stigma against gospel singers performing secular music. However, it fooled no one, Cook's unique and distinctive vocals were easily recognized. Art Roop, head of Specialty Records, the label of the Soul Stirrers, gave his blessing for Cook to record secular music under his real name, but he was unhappy about the type of music Cook and producer Bumps Blackwell were making. Roop expected Cook's secular music to be similar to that of another Specialty Records artist, Little Richard. When Roop walked in on a recording session and heard Cook covering Gershwin, he was quite upset. After an argument between Roop and Blackwell, Cook and Blackwell left the label. Lovable was never a hit, but neither did it flop, and indicated Cook's future potential. While gospel was popular, Cook saw that fans were mostly limited to low-income, rural parts of the country, and sought to branch out. Cook later admitted he got an endorsement for a career in pop music from the least likely man, his pastor father. My father told me it was not what I sang that was important, but that God gave me a voice and musical talent and the true use of his gift was to share it and make people happy. Taking the name, Sam Cook, he sought a fresh start in pop. In 1957, Cook appeared on ABC's The Guy Mitchell Show. 
That same year, he signed with Keen Records. His first hit, You Send Me, released as the B-side of Summertime, spent six weeks at number one on the Billboard R&B chart. The song also had mainstream success, spending three weeks at number one on the Billboard pop chart. It elevated him from earning $200 a week to over $5,000 a week. In 1958, Cook performed for the famed Cavalcade of Jazz concert produced by Leon Heflin Sr. held at the Shrine Auditorium on August 3. The other headliners were Little Willie John, Ray Charles, Ernie Freeman, and Bo Rombo. Sammy Davis Jr. was there to crown the winner of the Miss Cavalcade of Jazz Beauty Contest. The event featured the top four prominent disc jockeys of Los Angeles. Cook signed with the RCA Victor record label in January 1960, having been offered a guaranteed $100,000 by the label's producers Hugo and Luigi. One of his first RCA Victor singles was Chain Gang, which reached number two on the Billboard pop chart. It was followed by more hits, including Sad Mood, Cupid, Bring It On Home To Me, Another Saturday Night, and Twistin' The Night Away. In 1961, Cook started his own record label, Sar Records, with J. W. Alexander and his manager, Roy Crane. The label soon included The Sims Twins, The Valentinos, Mel Carter and Johnny Taylor. Cook then created a publishing imprint and management firm named CAGS. Like most R&B artists of his time, Cook focused on singles. In all, he had 29 top 40 hits on the pop charts and more on the R&B charts. He was a prolific songwriter and wrote most of the songs he recorded. He also had a hand in overseeing some of the song arrangements. In spite of releasing mostly singles, he released a well-received blues-inflected LP in 1963, Night Beat, and his most critically acclaimed studio album, Ain't That Good News, which featured five singles, in 1964. In 1963, Cook signed a five-year contract for Alan Klein to manage CAG's music and SAR Records and made him his manager. Klein negotiated a five-year deal with RCA Victor in which a holding company, Tracy, Ltd., named after Cook's daughter, owned by Klein and managed by J. W. Alexander, would produce and own Cook's recordings. RCA Victor would get exclusive distribution rights in exchange for 6% royalty payments and payments for the recording sessions. For tax reasons, Cook would receive preferred stock in Tracy instead of an initial cash advance of $100,000. Cook would receive cash advances of $100,000 for the next two years, followed by an additional $75,000 for each of the two option years if the deal went to term. Personal life Cook was married twice. His first marriage was to singer-dancer Dolores Elizabeth Milligan Cook, who took the stage name, D.D. Mohawk, in 1953. They divorced in 1958. She was killed in an auto collision in Fresno, California in 1959. Although he and Dolores were divorced, Cook paid for his ex-wife's funeral expenses. She was survived by her son Joey. In 1958, Cook married his second wife, Barbara Campbell, in Chicago. His father performed the ceremony. They had three children, Linda, Tracy, and Vincent, who drowned in the family swimming pool. Less than three months after Cook's death, his widow, Barbara, married his friend Bobby Womack. Womack sexually abused Cook's daughter, Linda. Linda married Womack's brother, Cecil Womack and they became the duo Womack and Womack. Cook also fathered at least three other children out of wedlock. In 1958, a woman in Philadelphia, Connie Bowling, claimed Cook was the father of her son. Cook paid her an estimated $5,000 settlement out of court. In November 1958, Cook was involved in a car accident en route from St. Louis to Greenville. His chauffeur Edward Cunningham was killed, while Cook, guitarist Cliff White, and singer Lou Rawls were hospitalized. Death Cook was killed at the age of 33 on December 11, 1964, at the Hacienda Motel, in south-central Los Angeles, California, located at 91st and Figueroa Avenue. Answering separate reports of a shooting and a kidnapping at the motel, police found Cook's body. He had sustained a gunshot wound to the chest, which was later determined to have pierced his heart. The motel's manager, Bertha Franklin, claimed to have shot him in self-defense. Her account was immediately disputed by Cook's acquaintances. The motel's owner, Evelyn Carr, said that she had been on the telephone with Franklin at the time of the incident. Carr said she overheard Cook's intrusion in the ensuing conflict and gunshot, and called the police. The police record states that Franklin fatally shot Cook, who had checked in earlier that evening. Franklin said that Cook had banged on the door of her office, shouting, Where's the girl? In reference to Elisa Boyer, a woman who had accompanied Cook to the motel, and who had called the police that night from a telephone booth near the motel minutes before Carr had. Franklin shouted back that there was no one in her office except herself, but an enraged Cook did not believe her and forced his way into the office, naked except for one shoe and a sport jacket. He grabbed her, demanding again to know the woman's whereabouts. According to Franklin, she grappled with Cook, the two of them fell to the floor, and she then got up and ran to retrieve a gun. She said she then fired at Cook in self-defense because she feared for her life. Cook was struck once in the torso. According to Franklin, he exclaimed, Lady, you shot me, in a tone that expressed perplexity rather than anger, before advancing on her again. 
She said she hit him in the head with a broomstick before he finally fell to the floor and died. A coroner's inquest was convened to investigate the incident. Boyer told the police that she had first met Cook earlier that night and had spent the evening in his company. She said that after they left a local nightclub together, she had repeatedly requested that he take her home, but he instead took her against her will to the Hacienda Motel. She said that once in one of the motel's rooms, Cook physically forced her onto the bed, and then stripped her to her panties, she said she was sure he was going to rape her. Cook allowed her to use the bathroom, from which she attempted an escape but found that the window was firmly shut. According to Boyer, she returned to the main room, where Cook continued to molest her. When he went to use the bathroom, she quickly grabbed her clothes and ran from the room. She said that in her haste, she had also scooped up most of Cook's clothing by mistake. She said she ran first to the manager's office and knocked on the door seeking help. However, she said that the manager took too long to respond, so, fearing Cook would soon be coming after her, she fled from the motel before the manager ever opened the door. She said she then put her clothes back on, hid Cook's clothing, went to a telephone booth, and called the police. Boyer's story is the only account of what happened between her and Cook that night, however, her story has long been called into question. Inconsistencies between her version of events and details reported by diners at Mardoni's restaurant, where Cook dined and drank earlier in the evening, suggest that Boyer may have gone willingly to the motel with Cook, then slipped out of the room with his clothing to rob him, rather than to escape an attempted rape. Cook was reportedly carrying a large amount of money at Mardoni's, according to restaurant employees and friends. However, a search of Boyer's purse by police revealed nothing except a $20 bill, and a search of Cook's Ferrari found only a money clip with $108 and a few loose coins. However, questions about Boyer's role were beyond the scope of the inquest, the purpose of which was only to establish the circumstances of Franklin's role in the shooting. Boyer's leaving the motel room with almost all of Cook's clothing, and the fact that tests showed Cook was inebriated at the time, provided a plausible explanation to the inquest jurors for Cook's bizarre behavior and state of undress. In addition, because Carr's testimony corroborated Franklin's version of events, and because both Boyer and Franklin later passed polygraph tests, the coroner's jury ultimately accepted Franklin's explanation and returned a verdict of justifiable homicide. With that verdict, authorities officially closed the case on Cook's death. Some of Cook's family and supporters, however, have rejected Boyer's version of events, as well as those given by Franklin and Carr. They believe that there was a conspiracy to murder Cook and that the murder took place in some manner entirely different from the three official accounts. Singer Etta James viewed Cook's body before his funeral and questioned the accuracy of the official version of events. She wrote that the injuries she observed were well beyond the official account of Cook having fought Franklin alone. James wrote that Cook was so badly beaten that his head was nearly separated from his shoulders, his hands were broken and crushed, and his nose mangled. Some have speculated that Cook's manager, Alan Klein, had a role in his death. Klein owned Tracy, Limited, which ultimately owned all rights to Cook's recordings. No concrete evidence supporting a criminal conspiracy has been presented. Aftermath The first funeral service for Cook was held on December 18, 1964, at A. R. Leak Funeral Home in Chicago. 200,000 fans lined up for more than four city blocks to view his body. Afterward, his body was flown back to Los Angeles for a second service, at the Mount Sinai Baptist Church on December 19, which included a much-heralded performance of The Angels Keep Watching Over Me, by Ray Charles, who stood in for a grief-stricken Bessie Griffin. Cook was interred at Forest Lawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Glendale, California. Two singles and an album were released in the month after his death. One of the singles, Shake, reached the top ten of both the pop and R&B charts. The B-side, A Change Is Gonna Come, is considered a classic protest song from the era of the civil rights movement. It was a top 40 pop hit and a top 10 R&B hit. The album, also titled Shake, reached the number one spot for R&B albums. Bertha Franklin said she received numerous death threats after shooting Cook. She left her position at the Hacienda Motel and did not publicly disclose where she had moved. After being cleared by the coroner's jury, she sued Cook's estate, citing physical injuries and mental anguish suffered as a result of Cook's attack. Her lawsuit sought $200,000 in compensatory and punitive damages. Barbara Womack countersued Franklin on behalf of the estate, seeking $7,000 in damages to cover Cook's funeral expenses. Elisa Boyer provided testimony in support of Franklin in the case. In 1967, a jury ruled in favor of Franklin on both counts, awarding her $30,000 in damages.